interesting, eh? You know, and it's been one of those days I, I didn't have a clue about this morning's service till I, till I really, while Michael was giving that testimony. And the same thing here, which is fine. So I don't run, you know, I'm not the boss here. Uh, I'm just trying to do what the Lord wants anyway. But since, uh, since this is the way he chose to do it, I didn't, I wasn't able to look up the scriptures. But I think what he wants to talk about uh, for just a little while tonight um, he doesn't want to substitute brass for gold. Do y'all remember in the Old Testament when uh, you know the vessels were taken, and uh, originally the all the instruments, the things that they used, uh, the bowls and everything in the, the the temple, and I think even in the tabernacle. I would know better about that, but they were made out of gold. You know the real deal, and then later on they substituted brass for gold now the, we're not really this is not talking about finances today when you've been pressing towards a mark okay let me get real specific because people are listening and watching maybe that uh, aren't that familiar we have a very specific mandate at the prayer center the first time i heard it i was hooked i've been hooked ever since i know that i'm to be a part of it i think you're here partly because you did the same thing happened to you but that mandate is to go far enough into God to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city. And we're talking about the hospital emptying kind. Now, first of all, it's just we're, you know, just like you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, now, I've taught that message several times where I took those five different meetings that Jesus had and it all stayed in the book of Matthew so that we know that we're not looking at duplicate, you know, two different people talking about the same meeting. No, these are five separate meetings. And uh, in the, yes, sir. And he wants, I'm going to say the scriptures again for people maybe that's hearing this that didn't hear this morning. If you want to look those up and see how a church is supposed to be, <laughs> let's look at how the head of the church ran them. Uh, we're not going to look at all these right now, but I want you to give them to you, and you can look them up later yourself. But you'll find here that in these where Jesus ran his own services, he healed them all. And some of these were massive services. Were not just a, One of them says a great multitude came. One of them says great multitudes came. Well, how many is that? 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. How long was that prayer line? <laughs> of course, he may have done a mass prayer. I don't know. We're not told. But anyway, if you want to make reference of those and get a good image of what, what the plan of God is for services, it's Matthew 4.24, Matthew 12.15, Matthew 15.30, Matthew 19.2, and Matthew 21.14. In every one of those, it, it either says plainly, He healed them all, or it says... And he healed them, which, if words mean anything, means them who. He healed them who was brought. <laughs> he healed them all, <laughs> okay? So when Jesus says to Philip, Philip, have I been so long with you? And you don't know who I am, Philip. If you, you want to know the Father, Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Being raised in a denominational church who loved God and would get people saved and preach the cross accurately, you know. I thank God for that. But they didn't know much about God's will when it come to healing. They'd always add that prayer at the end. If it be thy will. Meaning, they just, could, they just didn't know whether it was his will to heal. The cure for that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll just tell you right now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Until you've seen Jesus to the point that you know the Father's will regarding healing. If it really wasn't his will to heal everybody, then surely somewhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you would find Jesus saying to one of them that come, okay, the great multitudes, here's a great multitude. Why doesn't it say, and he healed them all who it was the Father's will to heal, and he didn't heal the ones whom it wasn't his will to heal? No, you don't find that anywhere where he says, okay, the Father wants to heal you, but not you. Yeah, he wants to heal these three. No, not that one over there. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do you find anything like that. The only person that even asked anything like that was the leper. 
He wasn't sure. And he says, I know you could heal me if you would, if you wanted to. And Jesus immediately reached, reached out his hand and says, I will be, be healed. So that's the Father's will. Why don't we see it anywhere on earth? Now, we see it sporadically. We see by the gifts, you know, we see little things, pockets of things happen. Somebody will get a healing. A miracle will happen here. Homer, through our own pa Homer. Homer is the associate pastor at Bronx Flint's church uh, down in Immokalee, Florida. Homer is a word man. Mike, you'd love Homer. Homer is a word man. And uh, I love Homer. And he's got such a heart for young people. He has, he has youth services on Sunday night. And I heard Bronx say this, so I'm not saying anything out of school. Sometimes the youth services on Sunday night, where they only come on Sunday night, are bigger than the main services on Sunday morning. <laughs> He's got a real good ministry, and especially to athletes and football players and getting them turned on to, to Christ, you know. And, uh, but Homer was going blind. He's just flat going blind. He's fighting uh, diabetes. He's lost like a hundred and... I forget now, well, over 100 pounds in the last few years to uh, help with uh, the diabetes, you know. But still, he was just flat going blind he, to the point he couldn't drive anymore. And he's, his job, he works for a gas company down there, and his job is like a regional manager, and he has to drive to all these different places. Well, he had to quit driving, get someone else to drive for him, you know. So Pastor Dave, his last trip down there on the very last night, the last service, he was just walking, you know how Dave does, how he does what he does, you know, ministering. And the Lord said, as he walked by Homer, he said, just lay your fingers on his eyes. I don't even know if Dave said anything. It's not on the tape if he did. He just did what the Lord told him. He said, just lay your fingers on his eyes. It wasn't instantaneous, instantaneous, but from that moment on, Homer's eyesight improved. He's driving now again. He's doing his own ministry again. He's, it's just amazing, see? So it's not like we don't see uh, miracles. We do, but it's like that. It's sporadic. It's like here. It's like there. You have to, you, you know, you hope to miss, don't want to miss a service because maybe that's the one, you know? <laughs> but that's, that's not the way that I see that Jesus did it, see? You could go and with confidence. That's why we have in our confessions what we see in the ministry of Jesus they, they, they all get healed, no matter what they come for, first time, every time, no exceptions. Because that's, that's what we see when Jesus does it. So nowhere on earth do I know of can you take an impossible case like uh, Victoria, who was born with a, uh, basically it's a birth defect, but, right? With a, it, you know, she needs a creative miracle. Let's say it that way. It's medical science with the best they have. They have, no, they have no help. Nowhere on earth at this moment do I know there's any place, any church, any ministry, no matter if it's a mega millions type ministry, is there anywhere on earth where you can take her or other cases like that and know for a surety when you go that they'll come back healed? Well, you could know that if Jesus was still on the earth. If we still had, what I mean is in his when he ran those, those meetings, you could know. Now, we have been called to do something that, to all of my, uh, not, to my awareness, is not being done anywhere on planet Earth. That means God is calling us to understand things and maybe do things that nobody else is really understanding or doing. So I thank God for Pastor Dave and how, and Dave doesn't have all the answers. If he did, we'd already be in the revival. He told me that one time. He says, Gary, don't stop praying. He said, there's a lot of mysteries we don't understand yet. And he says, I know that for sure, because if that was not the case, we'd already be in that revival. So just understand, yes, it's, it's a hard message here. That Mark Jenkins is just going to keep pounding us on fasting. I just know it. You know, this morning a message was about praying in tongues again. I said, oh, my God, can't you just tell me, I, you're, tell me I'm okay? You're okay. God loves you. But we're pressing towards something. We, we have an assignment from, uh, from the Master, and we're, we're, we're pressing towards that. So here, did I tell you where to turn? Oh, well, turn to Mark somewhere. Uh, Mark 9. We're going to look at a really tough case. Usually we go to Matthew, but I don't want to go there because that's where you have to talk about fasting. So we're going to look at the same. Usually it's Matthew 17. We're going to look at Mark here today because we're going <laughs> to. Uh, 
Now we've been, yes, we, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that's hard on the editors when that happens, but I, I just don't have any choice. See, yes, sir, he's bringing me back to the brass to gold thing, even though we're going to look at Mark. Now, what tends to happen, see, I have been pressing towards this. Uh, we've been here now 21 years. Uh, I, I look around. Daisy's been here longer than us. The Ehaws have been here longer than us. Uh, Darren may have been. I'm not sure. But he's been here a long time. And uh, many of you have been here a long time. What tends to happen over time, you become weary and well-doing. And if you're not careful, you begin, your vision begins to change, and you're no longer going for the gold, which is what really the mandate is, is going for the gold. You start having a tendency to substitute the brass. Now, we are not against programs here, okay? You know, midnight basketball, <laughs> swimming pools, uh, Whatever. I'm not against any of that. I thank God for anything that helps young people get off the streets and get them busy. But that's just not what we're called to here. And if you notice, we have, yeah, we have a, do we have a, a children's program? Yes, we have a room over there, and you're welcome to take your child in there. <laughs> Watch that child yourself while you listen to the speakers, and you can hear the message, you know. In other words, we're not going to substitute programs for the genuine anointing of God. We're not going to substitute Ishmael. Is, you see, anytime you decide you're going to help God, Ishmael is a good, good case of helping God. Well, maybe this is what God meant. No, God meant what he said. <laughs> well, maybe this is what, you know, human reasoning, well, I'm getting older, Abraham's getting older, if we don't have this baby pretty soon then it's going to be impossible. Oh, really? Well, see, that, leaves out the, that kind of thinking leaves out the God factor in the first place. So we've got to help God. So here they come up with a program, you know. And you all know, y'all, <laughs> you know the end. <laughs> I can't help it. Huh? You know the end result of that. Israel still today wishes Abraham would never have gone into that tent, I'll tell you right now, you know. Well, what it comes down to is if thou canst believe. So let's look here at this difficult case in Mark chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 14. He says, When he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. I think my father thought I had a dumb spirit. Well, you know, this is talking about can't talk, okay? <laughs> anyway, I love my dad. Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. He foams, that's foaming at the mouth, gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away. In other words... Apparently his appetite, you know, it's really, really thin. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And notice it doesn't say they would not. It says they could not. And they didn't know why they could not. That's what you really pick up here later. They didn't know. They had been casting out devils before. Now, this is the only case where we're really given these details. I think what, was, what affected their faith, and I'm not positive, so, you know, I'm not going to die on this mountain. But because of the visual manifestations, this kid wallowing on the ground and foaming at the mouth and looked like a skeleton. And, you know, I think it affected them. You say, oh, God, this is, you know. It, whatever they, whether it was that or whether it was something else, we do know they were not able to do it, yet they had been authorized to do it. See, we're, we're pretty much in that same boat. We have been authorized by the, the, the head of the church, called and authorized to do this very thing. Cast out devils, heal the sick, and I mean even the maimed to be made whole. I, I look for the day. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm looking for the day when we have all the news cameras back here because they've heard. And they come to watch while believers lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. And I mean even to the point of 
if the maimed were made whole, you know. Watching legs grow, won't that be a day? Legs growing out, arms growing out, new eyeballs coming in, you know. Won't that be something? See, we'll never get there if we substitute brass. We'll never get there if we take an easier, lesser path. The only way we're going to get there is the way that God has prescribed we get there. Well, why aren't we there now? Well, we've been authorized. So had they. They had been empowered to do it. What's the problem? Well, he tells them here in a little bit. So verse 18, this father's talking again to him. He says, Wheresoever that he taketh him, the father talking about the son and what that devil's doing to him, he teareth him, he foameth and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Now, we're coming in <clears throat> this next verse. I've got to preface it a little bit. Jesus, let's say it this way. The Holy Spirit is about to give the church the remnant. Okay, about to give us. I'm just going to talk about us, okay? A real nice, swift kick in the hiney. This little mamby-pamby Jesus that people seem to have an image of is not the one that I see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus has no trouble lo, you know, telling you like it is. And, and I, 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 I know he loves me. I know he forgives me. But I'm not so sure I need him to be so nice to me. I need him. If I, wherever I'm lacking, Lord, wherever it is, come talk to me. What if he come talk to you? I'm not looking at Mary for any reason. <laughs> Mary loves me. She's always real sweet. <laughs> I'm not looking. I just, you still love me, right? Okay, okay, all right. I'm good then. <laughs> Jesus comes down. See, here's what, here's what we would like. Well, you, you know, come over, give you an boy on the back. Well, I know you boys tried. At least you tried, you know, and you tried to cast it out, and you prayed, and I know that you did everything that you know to do, and I'm really proud of you guys. See, that's not the Jesus that I see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are, you, are we ready for this church? Are we ready? I don't know. <laughs> What if he comes to us and he said, what if he, what if he walked through the wall and here we've been contending for a revival and he says, Gary, step aside. I'm taking the service. And he, and even if Dave was sitting here now and he says, you faithless generation, not, not weak faith, not little faith. Does your Bible say what mine does? Faithless. <laughs> oh, faithless generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when, when he saw him straightway, that spirit tear him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. I think that same thing happened when the father brought him to the disciples. That devil, he did that same thing and it affected them. So Jesus asked the father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child. And oft times it has cast. <clears throat> we're having a little trouble with the new mic and we're trying different frequencies to see what the interference is. So let's try it again. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. We go by that too quick. To do what to him? What's the end result? What's that devil after? He's wanting to kill that boy. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, what's interesting, he's saying that to love in the flesh. Do you know love sometimes? If I need it, love, Jesus will say to Gary, if I need it, you. Why, are, Gary, why are you so faithless? And if I need it, Jesus, come say it. Please, Lord. Should I call this the kick in the hiney message? What shall I call this? I don't know. You know? And here's this father. Why did he bring his boy in the first place? The word had gotten out. Hey, these disciples of Jesus, they're able to cast out devils. You ought to take your boy. So and so. You know, so-and-so's boy got healed, and so-and-so's daughter got delivered, and you ought to take your boy. So here he comes. 
And of course, Jesus isn't there at that moment, but the disciples did everything they knew to do. And so now I don't blame him for saying, if you can, if you can do anything, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, boy, now here it is. Here it is. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. We quote that every week, don't we? Calling in the lost. So, my own soul, I command you, believe this. All things are possible. All things are possible. See, because you're going to get lots of evidence from the world, well-meaning friends, relatives. Just this very week, I had a couple of encounters with somebody that I just love very much. And they love the Lord. Don't get me wrong. They love the Lord. And I kept giving scripture, you know, like by his stripes, we are healed and himself bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. And that person would say, yes, but so-and-so just died. <laughs> and, and one of our relatives is sick. And I know you've prayed for them and they're still sick. So see, they're only giving the evidence of the five physical senses. But see, Jesus would give them some different evidence. That's what we're called to do. Not stand there and defend our powerless ministry. Justify it. But you have to stand up and stand, you have to stand for the word, even if you're not walking in the fullness of it yet, and do it in love. But they've got a valid case. There's this guy. Well, I don't know if you can do anything. I brought my son because I'd heard that you could. Your disciples, they tried, they couldn't. What about you? Jesus, he doesn't leave it. He doesn't just take the full brunt of that. He says, look, if you can believe. All things are possible to him that believes. Now, later on, in Matthew's account, later on, the disciples did ask him, why didn't it happen? Let's see. Does he say it here? Well, not exactly. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to go to Matthew's account to get the details in a minute. But anyway, Jesus said unto, unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Now, I'll just go ahead and I'll just own up to it. I can't even tell you the number of times in these years that I have prayed that exact prayer. When I have prayed and done everything I know to do, and I've, I've, I've confessed, and, I've, and it's a serious case, like life-threatening or something. If I, I'll just come to the Lord. If, it, if he had compassion on that guy with, with those words, I don't believe he's changed. He'll have compassion on me, too. And I've seen him answer that prayer. Lord, I'm believing with all I know how. Please, go beyond what I'm believing. Help thou my unbelief. And I've seen him do it and manifest the prayer anyway. Manifest the answer. So when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit. Now, in this case, and we're also going to have to learn by discernment, by the Holy Ghost, not all sickness is there a spirit involved, but by golly, some of them there is. And you can't just categorize okay like this one is and that one isn't you're going to have to have that information by the holy ghost word of knowledge or something to know whether to cast out a devil or whether to pray uh, pray for healing you know but in this case it was definitely a spirit so jesus said unto him thou dumb and deaf spirit i charge thee come out of him and enter no more into him and the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him and he was as one dead you know i'm amazed that that spirit was even able to do that but he, uh, he did It'd scare you to death, wouldn't it? You know, what if we're on ABC, CBS, NBC, you pray, and, ah! and then he lies there and he's, everyone thinks he's dead. Maybe he had no, po I don't know how bad it was, you know. And they're all saying he's dead. But Jesus, Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. Thank God. When he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth but by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And if we only had that, you would think it's that kind of devil. But that's, that's not what Jesus said was the core. So let's go on over to Matthew 17. All right, Mark, you get your way. <laughs> Listen to him laughing over there. <laughs> 
So we'll pick the story up in Matthew 17, 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart or privately and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, just so plain. He does not say because that's a really big, bad, nasty devil. He does not say that. He said it's because of your unbelief. I think he would say the same thing to us. They didn't know they had that unbelief. They probably didn't feel like they had that unbelief. Dave says it's a subtle kind of unbelief that you don't even know that you have. But then Jesus says unto them, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence. In other words, what he's really saying is, You think this devil's big? There had to be a mountain there. Well, they just come down off a mountain. That's right. They just come down off a mountain. He's saying, you think this devil is big? You think that's why you couldn't do it? I'm telling you, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed. And it would remove to yonder place. It shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Okay, Mark, are you happy? This kind of unbelief goes not out but by prayer and fasting. Now let's talk about the mustard seed for a minute. See, I grew up in a denomination, again, that had lots of messages about the mustard seed. And they would, over and over again, they would say things like, you know, just a little faith, just like a mustard seed, just a little faith, you know, is enough to move the mountain. And that's what they would get from this, not just this statement, but there are several other statements where he would say that. And so the, the idea you're left with is just a little faith, you know, man, it'll move the mountain. Trouble of it is, you don't ever find Jesus... Uh, bragging on or saying anything good about little faith. Sometimes he comes to him. He says, why are you are of such little faith? It's never like, oh, good, little faith. You can move the mountain. <laughs> the reason we, get, we just come to that conclusion is because everyone knows that a mustard seed is really small. So you think that's what he's talking about. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the same thing Mark was talking about in the 830 service. It's not the size of the mustard seed. It's the size of the image in the seed. And the, the key is not just to walk around with a grain of mustard seed. The key is, do you know how to release the image that's in the seed? Well, I didn't know for years. You know, everybody born again, genuinely born again for 2,000 years. Hallelujah. Every person born again for the last 2,000 years has received that same seed of the new birth, that seed of the new nature. But it's obvious not very many know how to nurture that, that image that's on the inside of there. There is an image. You talk about big. That image that's on the inside of you, that new nature is made in the image of God. That's what he's talking about. If you know how to bring forth the image of Christ in you, the hope of glory, if you know how to bring that to harvest, bring that to maturity the same way a farmer would not just walk around with mustard seed in his pockets thinking that's going to move the mountain. No, it's knowing how to release the image that's in that mustard seed. That's when you get the power that a, that a mustard seed plant produces. He says, if you learn how to release the power of the image that's on the inside of you. That's the secret. Then you, no, it's not a matter of a big devil. I'm telling you, that image that's on the inside of you, the image of the new nature, when it's empowered by the Holy Ghost, it can move that mountain. My goodness. The longer I'm in this, the more I'm convinced we're never mentally going to get there. There is no teacher on planet Earth, including Gary, Dave, Dr. Jim Martin, <laughs> I don't care how many PhDs and letters are behind your name. Now, they can teach whatever the Holy Ghost has taught, and that's why we have teachers in the body of Christ. But I am convinced there's hours spent listening to messages. See, the soul would rather, the soul of man, the, uh, the emotional part of Gary, the emotional part of you, does not like praying in other tongues. It just gets bored with it. It doesn't like it. It would rather listen to messages, you know. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with listening to good messages. 
But if we could mentally get there, then millions of people in the last 2,000 years would have got there. Right now, there's nowhere on planet Earth. And I am convinced the longer that I'm in this, no, nobody's going to get there without genuinely being taught by the Holy Ghost. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, until we come into the fullness of this. Nobody knows how to do it except Him. Nobody understands those mysteries but God. It's amazing to me. I still feel like God's favorite, His most blessed, His highly blessed of the Lord the day that I ever walked through the doors of this place. I never had a clue that there was any way that you could really tap into the supernatural teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit until we began to hear Dave teach on it. We'd been baptized in the Holy Ghost for 12 years before we ever got here. And I thank God that Michael Muccio, he didn't know the, he's the guy that led us to the Lord. He didn't know in any ways near the depth what tongues was like, like Pastor Dave knew. But he knew enough to know. He says, when you're praying, it's God praying. <laughs> he knew that much. And he wouldn't let me go with him to the prisons. And I wanted to go really bad. If you wanted to go to the prisons on Thursday night, you had to come pray on Tuesday night for two hours. First time I, I said, sounds good to me. I'll be there. Yeah, come pray in tongues for two hours. No problem. Dear God. Started praying in other tongues. You know, we're just, no music playing. We're just praying in other tongues, you know. <laughs> What's funny, it was at the clubhouse of the apartment building where he lived. <laughs> Anyway, other people were doing other things. We're over there quietly praying in other tongues. Shandara, Baklus, Sandale, Brestos, you know, we didn't care. And I thought, oh, yeah, two hours, we can do this. Man, he's praying and praying, and you look at your watch. Five minutes. <laughs> you thought she was going to die. But I thank God that he at least taught us a little bit of endurance, and we'd pray for two hours so we could go to the ministry, go to the prisons on Thursday nights, you know. Well... We're not going to say, I'm telling you, I have made up my mind. And Dave is, you know, y'all can tell Dave and Tim are smart, right? If they wanted to just run a normal church and make money and have programs and have a lot of people and have a nice fancy building and all of those things, trust me, those guys are smart enough to do it. But what I admire about them so much is even after all these years, they're not going for any brass. We're not going to settle for something that does not get Victoria her miracle. We're not going to settle for anything less than the gold. We're going to press towards that mark for the high calling of the prize that's in Christ Jesus. Now, while we're talking about that, go to Philippians 3. Because Paul himself, even with all of the revelation knowledge that he had and the miracles that you see in his ministry, even he himself said he did not count himself to fully apprehended or fully attained to this. But yet, he was sure got close enough. We see all kinds of miracles happening in his ministry, you know. Remember that guy that, it says Paul got a little long-winded in one of his services, and somebody fell asleep and fell out of the balcony? He died. Well, you know, time to call the morgue. No, just go over and pray, raise them up. Sit them in a pew, get them a glass of water, and finish your message. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> what kind of, what have you hooked into here, you know? So, you know this passage well, but Philippians 3, this has got to be our watchword here now. He says, his goal, starting in verse 9 of Philippians 3, is to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I nearly did a message this morning about knowing him, and I, I, I nearly did it, and, I, I'm, and I, if it doesn't happen this morning, it'll happen soon. But see, even after, even Paul, who wrote this letter, He's still endeavoring, pressing, that I may what? That I may know him. You remember what Jesus defined as eternal life in John 17, 3? That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. 
I checked this morning. I, I kept hearing that verse, and the other one I heard was, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. And I was curious. I was wondering if that was the same word. It is. The same Greek word. And these guys said, their excuse was, Hey, we've been casting out devils and prophesying in your name. And he still said to them, Depart from me. You that work in, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> Depart from me. Depart from you that work iniquity. <laughs> I never knew you. Boy, I don't want that. So Paul says, his goal is to be found in him, in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now notice, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. It's a mortification message, people. It's a mortification message. Paul's not asking to be crucified on a cross. He's asking to come to that same place where he can bring his flesh to a total standstill, just like Jesus did. Through sufferings, he learned obedience, even the obedience of the cross. He agonized like anybody would agonize in the garden to do that perfect will of the Father, agonized in the flesh. Yet he still came to that place of obedience. It is a mortification message. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff taught about that, like some resurrection in the future. He's talking about Romans 6. That we should, if we have been buried with him in baptism, we should also walk in newness of life. He's talking about walking with that, in the, walk as him. Walk in that newness of life that we've really been made. It's what he said to the Ephesians that you put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. He says, I want to know him. That I bring my, the complete mortification, like he was able to do, bring his flesh to an absolute standstill where it didn't do, have any con control over him. And at the same time, walk in that resurrection life. Walk in that new nature life brought to maturity like we're talking this morning in 1 Corinthians 13 walking in it and I never did say this this morning <sighs> try it again chapter 12 is really talking about the gifts that really were available to Old Testament saints everything except two and that's tongues and interpretation of tongues chapter 13 talks about a better way which is really the New Testament way that you l allow yourself to be grown up into love but see, 14, chapter 14, it starts talking about, well, how would I do that? How would I do that? How would I, what can I do to come to that deeper level of love? He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. How be it in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. No man understands him. It's those very mysteries. Why? The, it's those infirmities of the flesh. It's the unbelief that we still have. All of those things, that's what the Holy Spirit knows. And that's the very, very mysteries that he will do away with if we will allow his ministry. And I'm convinced that's the only path. The Holy Spirit is the only one that's ever going to get us, get us there. So it's not to the swift. It's not to the most educated. It's not to the brightest. It's to the one who will bow the knee the most to the Holy Ghost. Hey, that rhymes. Bow the knee the most to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> that's the one that's going to allow that teaching to go far enough. Again, I'm going to close with, no, I'm, let me finish this. <clears throat> if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. And this is Paul writing. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. For us, that thing before is revival. <laughs> I press 
toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That high calling of God, you can draw a little arrow right back up here where he talks about that I may know him and the power of his resurrection being made conformable unto his death so that I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's the high calling. We walk as he walked, talk as he talked, have the same results that he had. As he is, so are we in this world. So let's, I know it's easy. The longer that you, you're doing this, pressing in, it, it's easy to become weary and well-doing. But let's never start substituting brass for gold. There's only one path. I think we're, um, I think it's amazing and astounding that I would be one that was included here to even hear these mysteries being taught. At least we've been given our shot. At least we've been given a chance to see what's not been seen since the book of Acts. Let's go for it. Let's keep on. Just like he says, I press. It's a pressing. Press. Pressing against what? The flesh. Pressing against that. Till we have that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And what I started to say a while ago, I saw that little vision again that Dave has described to us so many times. Early on in this walk, he saw, saw the earth and he saw this dark band around the earth. But on the other side of that dark band was glory, you know. And in the vision, he saw somebody stick their hand. They managed to get their hand up through that dark band. And their hand would begin to glow with that same glory. Then back on earth, when they lay their hand on people, they'd get healed. He said, I saw somebody would get their whole head up through there. And when they come back, they would teach with just this incredible anointing, like from the third heavens, you know. Then every now and then, there'd be somebody who they'd get their whole person up through there. And when they come back... He said, those were the revivalists. Man, I mean, wherever they were, it's like revival fires would break out. There wouldn't be very many of those. So he was saying, like in the vision, okay, that dark band, that's the devil. And God said, no, that's not the devil. That's your flesh. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we've been given, we have the mandate, and we've been given instructions how to get there. People don't become weary in well-doing. We're not going to substitute brass for gold. That's, one, that's why we say at one point, I got, I got uh, rebuked one time by somebody who came to this message because it says we're going for the gold. And they didn't know me at all, and they thought we were talking about money. <laughs> we're not going for the money. <laughs> the money serves us as we serve Christ. Amen? No, we're going for the gold. We want the pure ministry of Jesus. 